Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. So this episode is a part two. So if you haven't listened to part one about the design and development, prototypes, and production of the 190, you should check that out first. But if you're already up to speed, let's get to operational history. Once the 190 was introduced, it fought everywhere the German forces went, and in many different roles. Here are some of the highlights. The FW-190 arrived on the Western Front in August 1941, and in the beginning, the Allied pilots it took on didn't know what they were up against. Some even thought that this new German radial engine fighter were Curtis P-36 Mohawks that the Luftwaffe had lifted from the French and repainted in their own colors. But this was no Mohawk. The new fighter was superior to the Spitfire, which was the top RAF fighter at the time, in all manners except turning radius. The FW-190 also had the Spitfire beat in terms of rate, roll, and pure straight-line speed at low altitude. The 190 also outgunned the Spitfire in terms of firepower. The Luftwaffe gained air superiority over the channel front in no small part to the 190. Now at some point the 190 got the nickname of Butcher Bird. The Luftwaffe had named the plane after a bird called the Verger. In English this bird is called the Shrike but the scientific name for the Shrike is Lanius, which is Latin for butcher. And this innocent looking little bird lives up to its name. Shrikes catch insects and then impale them on thorns or any other sharp point. They use these spikes to tear their victim's flesh into small manageable bits or leave their prey crucified on these spikes for several days for later consumption. Loggerhead shrikes will kill small animals by using their sharp beaks to stab their necks and then violently shake them to death. Allied pilots, especially bomber pilots, would soon learn that the butcher birds had been aptly named. During Operation Jubilee, the Allied raid on Dieppe in August 1942, 115 190s were involved in the day's aerial battles. The RAF sent over 300 fighters, including Hurricanes, Spitfires, Allison-engined Mustangs, and even some of the new Hawker Typhoons. At the end of the day, 25 FW-190s had been lost, but in return, they claimed 61 of the 106 Allied aircraft lost that day. Soon the 190s were showing their versatility when they were configured as Jagd bombers or fighter bombers. These Yabos would sweep in low across the channel, hot and fast, and hit shipping and ports in southeast England. The RAF was almost powerless to stop these high-speed, low-altitude, below-the-radar attacks. As soon as RAF fighters scrambled to intercept them, the intruders were already gone. In April 1943, the ABO units were merged into Schnellkampfgeschwader 10 and began switching to night operations. The unit's first mission on the night of 16 to 17 April was especially bad, and actually downright embarrassing, when four 190s during their attack on London got lost, thought that they had crossed the channel into France, but were actually still over merry old England. They then tried to land at RAF West Maling. The result was several interned Luftwaffe pilots and a captured fully intact 190, which was a boon as it was subsequently evaluated and test flown by the RAF. In mid-1943, the RAF's building night bomber offensive caused 190s to be called on to help defend the Reich at night. They were engaged in wild sow, wild boar tactics, which allowed the 190s free reign to fly over bombed and burning areas to see if they could locate bombers using the light from the ground fires below. If possible, these aircraft were modified with exhaust dampers and blind flying equipment, and some even carried radar. 
Meanwhile, increasing USAAF activity over the Reich during the day demanded a response by the 190 squadrons. Although the 190 was already a very robust aircraft that packed a powerful punch, going up against the combat boxes of tough B-17s and B-24s and facing the thousands of 50 caliber bullets and increasing numbers of Allied escort fighters required enhancements for the Butcher Bird. Conversions allowed the 190 to carry two more 20mm and then 30mm cannon under the wings. 1.2 inches of armored glass was added to the canopy. The two synchronized twin cow mount 7.92 millimeter machine guns were swapped out for double sized 13 millimeter, that's 0.51 caliber MG31 guns. Some aircraft were fitted with rails for underwing rockets. All of this extra stuff was making the 190 very heavy and cumbersome. Some were given the GM1 nitrous oxide boost system to allow the BMW 801 engine to increase its performance at high altitude. Even so, the 190s that were configured as bomber killers weren't well able to protect themselves against Allied escort and so required escorts themselves in the form of BF 109s that would give them cover while the 190s focused on the bombers. If there was one real disadvantage to the 190, it was that it was not great at high altitude. Kurt Tank decided that serious measures were needed to adopt the 190 for height climbing. Firstly, he decided that the BMW 801 radial engine just wasn't going to cut it, and after a period of searching, settled on the UMO 213, which was a V12 liquid-cooled aircraft engine. It's interesting that this fighter, which at first was notable as being a radial engine fighter, would not only switch engines, but to a completely different cylinder configuration. But the Yumo 213 was certainly an impressive power plant. Firstly, it was designed as a crafty, or power egg system, which allowed engines to be easily swapped out with just four bolts and attachments. The version that was mainly installed in the 190 had a three-speed, two-stage intercooled supercharger that delivered 1,750 horsepower or 2,050 horsepower with a 50-50 water methanol injection boost. It also used a pressurized cooling system that was so efficient that it allowed the engine to run much harder and used much less coolant than the usual atmospheric type. To understand this, think of how a pressure cooker can operate much hotter and with much less cooking fluid than a pot of boiling water. In order to house the lengthy UMO 213, the 190's nose had to be extended, and in order to maintain balance, the tail had to be subsequently stretched. This version was numbered FW-190D and was nicknamed as Long-Nosed Dora, Lang Nasen Dora, or just Dora. Pilots were initially suspicious of the funny-looking version with the different engine, but their fears were soon allayed. First, they were comforted by how the aircraft was so well armored with 14 millimeter plate for the pilot's head and shoulders, eight millimeter plate for the seat back and surrounding cockpit, and even armored rings around the cowling to protect the engine. You'd think that all this weight would affect performance, but it did not. The Dora could outclimb and outdive its radial engined predecessor easily, and had a great turning rate, even at speed. The pilots who flew the FW-190D felt that it was the finest propeller-driven fighter available to the Luftwaffe during the entire war, and some considered it more than a match for even the P-51D Mustang. Doras were sometimes used as top cover, used to protect ME-262 jets as they took off or landed. Between 650 and 700 Doras were built before the occupation of Fuckewolf factories by Allied forces brought production to an end. 
although the 190 continued to be a worthy opponent to the rising numbers of Allied aircraft from mid-1944, no matter how good it or its pilots were, they were being overwhelmed. On D-Day, German fighters of all types flew just 760 sorties, compared to an Allied total of 14,000. In the several weeks of fighting over Normandy, 200 FW-190s and 100 pilots were lost. On the Eastern Front, the 190 was a valued weapon and was considered better suited to the often primitive conditions of that front. It handled well on the ground, and its wide undercarriage made it more stable than the 109. It could also absorb more damage than the BF-109 and survive to get back to base due to its radial engine. On the initial invasion and offensive, increasing numbers of 190s were used in the air supremacy role. As the Wehrmacht exhausted itself in the attack, the 190s were called upon more and more for Yabo fighter-bomber missions, both hitting ground targets with bombs and strafing attacks, and fighting off Soviet fighters. Later on, with the Red Army on the advance, 190s would fly multiple sorties a day, trying to stem the tide of Soviet armor. One limiting factor was fuel, which was in short supply. A policy was instituted to save the precious fluid that Luftwaffe pilots were ordered to shut down their engines immediately after landing and their planes would be towed to and from dispersal by animals such as oxen. It's strange to think of this modern weapon being maneuvered around by this ancient manner of transportation. The penultimate version of the 190 was actually known as the TA-152, with the TA coming from tank's name. The TA-152 was quite similar to the Dora, but to aid in reaching even higher altitudes, the cockpit was pressurized. An air compressor provided the pressure, and the canopy was sealed by a circular tube which was inflated by a compressed air bottle. Armament was increased to a 30mm Mark 108 motor cannon firing through the propeller hub, and two 20mm MG-152-20 cannons located in the wing roots. The TA-152's engine had both nitrous oxide boost and water methanol boost. They could be used individually or both at the same time. Kurt Tank needed both himself when he was flying an unarmed TA-152H in late 1944 to a meeting and was warned by ground controllers that two P-51 Mustangs were on his tail. Tank applied full power, kicked in both boosters, open quotes, until they, the Mustangs, were no more than two dots on the horizon, close quotes. Only about 69 TA-152s were built before production ceased. Survivors. At 28 examples, there are actually quite a few surviving FW-190s. They are located in multiple countries, including Germany, France, Norway, Serbia, South Africa, United Kingdom, and 11 of them in the United States. Several are airworthy. So in the end, I think we have to say that Tank and his team built what they had set out to build. A loyal cavalry horse for the Luftwaffe. The 190 did what it was supposed to do, and more. And although no airplane is perfect, it had no serious vices. During the course of its operational life, it was updated and adapted to keep up with and even surpass the state-of-the-art Allied planes. If asked to do the job of a fighter bomber, or night fighter, or high-altitude bomber killer, it was adaptable for those roles and did them well. Even the Allied pilots who flew it had a wholehearted respect for the Butcher Bird and considered it an equal to their own best planes. And to earn the respect of your opponent, well... I guess it doesn't get much better than that. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and I love to hear your comments. Until next time.